So we'll begin with a very quick recap of uh, whatever we had been discussing uh, so far in the last couple of sessions. Mostly we had been taking a look at the ways in which historically this genre has been located in particular ways. And uh, we also began with this very controversial remark by uh, Rushdie in his Vintage Book of Indian Writing, which he also co-edited with Elizabeth West. Uh, this is what he said, the prose writing, both fiction and non-fiction created in this period is proving to be a stronger and more important body of work than all the you know, official languages, the writings in the vernacular. And this also represents, he concludes, the most valuable contribution India has yet made to the world of books. And there is also a range of things that he talks about, which we, you know, some of those things we try to, uh, uh, you know, situate the historic nature of uh, those articulations. We also try to see from where these uh, biases against Indian writing, uh, Indian uh, literatures in uh, other languages are, are coming from. What was the historic need to locate two different camps, Indian writing, Indian writers in English versus Indian writers in other languages. And uh, in order to do that, we also access certain works. We had particularly taken a look at two works, one by edited by Arvind Krishna Mehrotra, Illustrated History of Indian uh, Literature in English and the other an earlier work and the pioneering work by Srinivas Iyengar. And M. K. Naik's work, though we have not really taken a look at well, work per se in detail, we uh, also in the discussions got a sense that M. K. Naik pretty much articulates and reiterates most of the things that Srinivas Iyengar said. What makes uh, Naik's works more uh, distinctive is perhaps the fact that it was a Sahitya Academy uh, publication. Yes, he was commissioned by the Saiti Academy to write this particular uh, literary history. So, there is a way in which uh, Nayak also further legitimizes the many things that Iyengar talks about in uh, his uh, Indian writing in English. There were certain uh, observations, certain similar uh, sorts of tracing that we located in all of these uh, works and when they, when they all tried to locate the uh, origins of Indian writing in English, this uh, invariably had a very similar kind of trajectory, though their articulations, the uh, rhetoric of it differed, the way in which you know they accented particular uh, things rather than other things or those things perhaps differed, but other than that there are these similar origins. Uh, first of all, you know they speak about colonial encounter particularly uh, uh, with a uh, very emphatic accent on the aspect of modernity, about colonial modernity and also there are differing ways in which you know you can talk about colonial modernity, those are perhaps you know discussions that you can come back to when you talk about individual works and authors and there is also an emphasis being placed on English education and the role of English education, not just uh, as you know a formal set of education, but also in the way in which the uh, Indians who are educated in English were also getting familiar with a number of works published originally in English in the uh, western uh, context. Yeah. So, um, all of those things collectively they seem to have a major import in uh, producing uh, you know various kinds of uh, new kinds of prose writings and novel writings in English and vernacular uh, languages. So, it also brings our attention to the role played by the vernacular languages and literature which all of them you know, interestingly uh, agree about maybe the, the, the sort of uh, accents that play, they place on the degree of the uh, influence that may differ, but otherwise you know there is a general consensus about how uh, with the advent of English education, with this advent of modernity, there is also a particular kind of uh, vernacular literary tradition which was also uh, emergent and that in a, a certain ways it also exists as a, uh, as a parallel to the Indian writers and Indian writings in English. And uh, uh, Mehrotra and uh, uh, Srinivas Iyengar, they also draw attention to these varied kinds of uh, things which are happening, the emergence of you know how printing presses, uh, not really the emergence of the printing presses, but particularly how the emergence of a certain kind of a print culture in English, it also uh, you know accelerates this process, there is this uh, journalism activities happening not just in English, but also in a number of uh, uh, you know in Indian languages about the missionary activities, though there is we do not find a particular kind of an emphasis placed on the missionary activities that is also being uh, discussed. There is nationalist history and nationalist movement of course, with you know Gandhi and uh, uh, many other nationalist reformers, uh, they are also being uh, designated this uh, the, the title of the uh, say uh, the, f the 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 ones who wrote the first biographies such as Ram Mohan Roy or the ones who inaugurated a certain literary tradition of writing in English so on and so forth. And Gandhian influence is something you know that needs to be underscored throughout 
and it also comes back to uh, visitors in multiple ways when we talk about the uh, novels of the 1920s uh, and 30s and also the novels of the 1980s which revisit the nationalist history. The language debates they also uh, take such an enormous proportion that there are constitutional interventions which are needed in the form of language bills. Yeah, it is needed to contain the 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 the, uh, the debate, the various problems, the issues related to communities, linguistic communities, the issues related to commu uh, linguistic communities say uh, getting at loggerheads with uh, each other. So, there are also certain events, moments and uh, particular literary, non-literary uh, figures who are being uh, foregrounded such as you know uh, the <coughs> British domination and the various ways in which happens. So if you remember, you know, there is an emphasis that they all plays on uh, events such as the Battle of uh, Plassey, the Battle of Buxar, uh, about, you know, the granting of this uh, Diwani and also the uh, role played by the Orientalists and whom uh, uh, Srinivas Iyengar also refers to as the Brahmanized Britons with the kind of role that they played in now, elevating the status of the Indian uh, languages, Indian culture in uh, though with an uh, orientalist accent of course and then the celebrated uh, minutes by Macaulay in 1835 and a series of figures associated with Bengal renaissance and uh, this again we also recall this could be a contested notion but nevertheless it is also a very important uh, historical moment to be reckoned with featuring say Ram Mohan Roy, Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay. Uh, the emergence of the setting up of Hindu college in the early 19th century, 1817 and uh, the role uh, played by De Rosio, Michael Madhusudan Rath. Yeah. So, it is an amalgamation of many things, literary and non-literary coming together, institutional and non-institutional practices coming together to uh, eventually lead us towards the history of Indian writing in English. And there is this uh, Mormon 1857 revolt which is responded to in multiple ways by historians as well as there are these two early uh, writings which are being made possible by Kalash Chandradath and Shoshi Chandradath who talk about the possibility of an insurrection, who talk about the need for a subversive kind of uh, narrative in the context of the uh, anti-colonial uh, movements. There is also this discussion about the first novels which appeared in the regional languages. Yeah, mind you, we are not really talking about the Indian writing in English, but also about the regional novels. So, uh, there, there are these lots of discussions about uh, the first novels which appeared, what were their characteristics and how do they also act as a corollary to say 1835 minutes or the British domination or the multiple ways in which they engage with modernity and the kinds of renaissances which were being made possible. Yeah, so, in that context it is also uh, important to remember later when we look at uh, Minakshi Mukherjee's essay, the uh, beginnings of the novel, she talks about how every language was vying with each other for this position of being the first, the very first novel. Yeah. So, that uh, she also uh, uh, you know, uh, talks in detail about the many things which made the first uh, possible. Yeah. So, moving on, some of the concerns, debates and frameworks that would emerge from these discussions yeah, and this would also continue to dominate the many discussions that we would be having about Indian uh, writing in English, particularly about Indian fiction in English. Uh, the most important one is the English Pasha divide. This is either engaged with within the narratives of particular works or we may be using that as a framework as one of the concerns or it could be one of the debates on which uh, you know the discussions are being staged. This could also take another dimension in terms of the translations and translations not just from Indian languages to the uh, from Indian languages to English, but there are also these translations of uh, iconic novels in written in uh, English such as you know one, some of the recent controversies would be the translation of a suitable boy. Yeah. So, uh, there was certain elements which are omitted in particular regional translations and how various um, critics and translators respond to that, those are certain debates that we would be uh, uh, visiting in, in, in course of this our uh, discussions. And the idea of bilingualism about you know the authors writing both in English and in the regional writers also being forced to take a certain position about uh, Indian writing in English or about regional writers and this also has a historical context as we have already noted in some of the discussions that we had and we also uh, saw these many births which are being uh, spoken about and these moments, these historic moments uh, become important for us when we talk about uh, Indian writing in English in terms of the canon, in terms of the literary tradition. Yeah. So, uh, again you know this becomes important because these births there is, there is a certain 
canonical, traditional, conventional way in which certain convenient moments, convenient dates have been given as starting points, as births. But the moment you, you intervene with something like Dalit writing or you intervene with uh, say something uh, like a feminist writing or women writing, yeah. so uh, uh, suddenly you realize that there is something wrong, there is something inherently flawed about these conceptions, these starting points. Yeah. So it also, uh, 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 this framework it ne need not necessarily always be, you know, uh, cast in uh, stone, carved in stone. It could also be certain platforms to, uh, for us to ask newer questions, to challenge the existing yardsticks or frameworks in uh, many different ways. And these discussions about Indianness, Minakshi, Minakshi Mukherjee has an entire essay about the anxiety of Indianness and how, you know, she locates a certain anxiety in the Indian writers in English to be Indian more than the others. This is like uh, the the uh, it, it's, it's also an offshoot of the uh, uh, the the bilingualism, the bilingual practices that some of these authors had about English being part of a colonial residue and the native vernacular tongue being part of a more traditional and a more loyal nationalistic uh, approach. Yeah, and also certain things which Mehrotra particularly drew our attention to, and these th three aspects, in fact, will continue to be it will continue to resonate with most of the works that we uh, will be talking about, uh, uh, the idea of transnationalism, how global market plays a certain kind of a role. There are, uh, there is a way in which, you know, uh, certain um, uh, critics, again, you know, we go back to Meenakshi Mukherjee as an immediate reference. She talks about certain passages and how they were not written for the Indian audience. She talks about, you know, certain uh, uh, exotic India is being generated in the descriptions for a Western audience, for a predominantly Western audience. And it is uh, the, the description, she says, a, a writer who is writing in uh, one of the vernacular uh, tongues, one of the regional languages would not have resorted to this particular description. We will come back to those details at a later point. And post-colonialism is an interesting phenomenon and a very, very important framework within which we will be looking at uh, some of the later novels. But also you would have noted, though we spoke about post-colonialism, though post-colonial moments were used as an intervention in some of the discussions that we had in the last couple of sessions. These writers per se, the historians per se had not really referred to, had not really, you know, underscored the post-colonial moment much. Yeah. And uh, also, you know, about talking about the major frameworks within which we will be understanding most of the texts that we uh, are talking about, nation is a very important, very important event over there. Yeah. And uh, it's, it becomes impossible to talk about most of these novels without referring to the nation and also nation in that sense becomes both an advantage as well as a very delimiting component in some of the discussions. And these uh, three figures, Macaulay, who is a colonial administrator, Gandhi, who is a leader of the uh, nationalist movement, and Rushdie, who is an author in this post-colonial globalized uh, market, yeah, who is catering primarily to the Indian writing in English. Yeah. These three figures, we realize that you know, there is an uncanny way in which they come, they come together in this field, uh, this field of study in Indian writing in English. Yeah. And um, Macaulay, if you uh, remember in the introduction to Mehrudra's uh, literary history, he talks about an excerpt from one of uh, uh, Rushdie's work, where Rushdie refers to bloody Macaulay's minutes. Yeah. So, bloody Macaulay's men. Yeah. So, uh, there is a way in which a rejection of Macaulay and an adoption of Gandhi becomes very important to stage certain debates, to talk about certain kinds of Indianness and the absence of certain kinds of modernities. In the same way, Gandhi also becomes a problematic figure. Uh, an uncritical you know, acceptance of Gandhi also becomes a problem. We note that, notice that particularly in the post uh, uh, 1980s novels where they are critiquing the very idea of the nation and also the ways in which the nation has been narrated. Yeah? And Rushdie for a very different reasons, uh, he becomes a framework because he becomes a trendsetter in a certain way. He becomes a yardstick against which the others are being evaluated. Though he is not really asked for it, Rushdie becomes the image, the face of post-colonial writing and he also becomes such a towering figure that it becomes either you know either you have to be like Rushdi to match up to that sort of a standard or you have to be continually in a in a position of being marginalized because you are not writing like Rushdi and others are writing yeah so these three frameworks and these three very divergent frameworks they continue to inform most of our understanding of uh, 
uh, Indian writing in English, particularly fiction, and also the evaluation, the evaluatory practices that we, uh, you know, we meet out to these uh, sort of um, writers as well as writings. Yeah. So uh, today, you know, we begin uh, looking at. Um, some of the things that Minakshi Mukherjee talks about. Yeah, I hope you've had a, a chance to at least uh, uh, know, go through the two chapters from realism and uh, reality. This is considered as one of the uh, significant interventions that Minakshi Mukherjee makes, Realism and Reality, the novel in society in India. She also wrote another book, an earlier work entitled Twice Born Fiction, in which she engages only with Indian fiction in English. But then she feels that, you know, it's an important uh, uh, moment. The 1980s, she identifies as an important moment to also look at the history of Indian novel in general. Because she thinks just like there is a particular tradition associated with the western novel, it is a very important to see a novelistic tradition which is native to uh, India as well. So, this is seen as a very landmark kind of a, uh, 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 text not just for uh, Indian writing in English but also for you know Indian novels, the, the scene of the Indian novel in general. So. Uh, she also begins on a very uh, similar note. Yeah. So, uh, I hope you have had a chance to look at Minakshi Mukherjee's uh, both the works. Uh, her work also begins with this, you know, a tribute to Macaulay's minute. So, in that sense, she, she is also not really departing from the major things that the other uh, historians and the other critics had been uh, talking about. Here, there is this uh, thing that you would find right at the outset in her. Uh, the first chapter from Purana to Nutana, yeah, she talks about it is not an accident that the first crop of novels in India in Bengali and Marathi appeared exactly a generation after Macaulay's educational minutes, making English a necessary part of an educated Indian's mental makeup. Where past, yeah. So, her focus is on the educated Indian and how that becomes that moment of the emergence of the educated Indian also becomes an important moment for the emergence of a certain kind of uh, writing. Yeah. So, moving on to the details, what Meenakshi Mukherjee in her preface also, you know, if you uh, take a look at it, she says her objective is to give a broader framework, a yeah, broader perspective and also a theoretical framework to trace the development of novel in India because these two things are clearly absent even in the beginning of the 1980s. There are no uh, sort of you know there is no way in which you know you can approach Indian novel in general from a broader perspective just like you could approach perhaps you know the British novel yeah, from a uh, broader perspective. Yeah. So, uh, hers is like you know um, she is uh, in, in her work you can see that she is both a literary critic as well as a historian. She assumes both these positions to talk about the uh, uh, the framework that she is, uh, she uh, you know, hope she, uh, she hopes will eventually evolve. So, uh, uh, and she also you know identifies this um, uh, uh, novel in general as the se second youngest narrative, which is the youngest narrative, she says. Film, cinema. Yeah. She says you know novel is the second youngest narrative that is available to uh, uh, the you know for consumption in the 20th century. And um, this entire thing, she begins to locate this at a level which is more than a literary exercise. And this is where she departs from all her literary ancestors that she wants to locate the idea of Indian novel as more than a legacy of British truth. If you look at the frameworks which uh, we had taken a look at, the ways in which the historical uh, you know reasons, uh, you know, a certain etiology had been set. It is predominantly within a colonial framework, pr predominantly within a legacy of British rule. She is not necessarily departing entirely from that, but she is also drawing her attention to uh, the need to be aware about certain other things which are outside of uh, you know the colonial modernity, which are outside of these many things that we usually talk about. Yeah, In her own words, the Indian novel in general has been seen as born out of the tension between opposing systems of value in the colonial society and modified by certain uh, indigenous pressures. But this modification by indigenous pressures had not been dealt with in detail until the early 1980s. Manakshi Mukherjee is the one who initiates us into such a discussion where it is possible to bring both of these elements together. The tension between opposing systems of value in a colonial society and also the uh, indigenous pressures which also you know played a major role and again in the first part also in identifying the tension between the opposing systems of value in a colonial society she further fleshes that aspect out and draws her attention to certain things very nuanced things which had perhaps been overlooked by other critics and other 
historians. When she uh, begins talking about the rise of the Indian novel and here you know I also want you to recall the rise of uh, the novel that you have learned in the western uh, context about you know ab about how it was seen as a say a product of uh, a renewal, uh, uh, a renewal of the middle class. It was seen as a, a corollary of uh, the rise of individualism. So these things, she talks about in a very brief vein, just about two or three paragraphs. She talks about the emergence of the novel in the West and how that is, uh, you know, also corresponds to the various moments of formal realism and how it could be seen as, you know, a product of the middle class and how it also celebrates the idea of the rise of. Uh, individualism. And then she asks this pertinent question. So, how do we begin to situate the same, the same genre <coughs> when we begin to talk about that in the uh, cultural and historical context of India? What does it imply? What are the consequences? So, for that, uh, uh, initially she uh, draws her attention to certain pre novel or uh, traditional narratives. She uh, speaks about, you know, some particular works, the details of which we will not be going into. She also does not really uh, intend to stay on to discuss these, uh, the pre-novel traditional narratives. Uh, if you go through at a later point, you know, if you have still not taken a look at it, from the end of page 8, page 9 and page 10, she draws her attention to certain pre-novel narratives which were available even before the advent of uh, colonial modernity in India. As an offshoot from those discussions, she begins to talk about what makes the modern novel. She is not necessarily saying in a blind way that the pre-novel narratives were the actual, uh, say, uh, in those pre-novel narratives we can actually locate the origins of Indian novel. She is not really trying to say that either. She is uh, initially, uh, it is a, uh, in, in fact, you know, most of uh, Mukherjee's essays, if we uh, go through them, her work, there is a systematic way in which she lines up a number of things. She not just tells us what she intends to, uh, you know, what her primary objectives in the study uh, are. She also draws her attention to why she is not taking the many other alternate routes uh, perhaps, you know, we would also be contemplating about. Here, since she drew her attention to the pre-novel narrative, she is also telling us uh, in a very systematic, in a, in a, in a very illustratory uh, fashion that they cannot be the origins. You cannot trace it back directly to the pre-novel narratives yeah, from Sanskrit or from various traditions available to India from multiple sources. Yeah, because modern novel in her own words is an organic product of a specific environment in a particular society at a given point of history and it is also bound by historical and geographical coordinates. She also tries to differentiate say these uh, fables yeah, and uh, the works of the oral tradition from that of the novel arguing that the fables and the pre-novel narrative, the traditional narratives need not really necessarily have a proper setting. It, the, the story could have happened in province A or province X or in an entire empire, yeah? such where the, uh, the, uh, the characteristics of you know those sorts of narrations, the plot uh, uh, in, uh, arrangements so on and so forth. So here she is drawing her attention to this modern novel, it is in page number 5 talking extensively about you know how a novel is not like a medieval tale. Yeah? So she is also preempting the possibility of anyone later on coming and saying see it is not essentially a modern thing, yeah? it is also an offshoot of the many, many kinds of narratives that we had from the ancient literary traditions onwards yeah? and that is also something that she does very systematically with a lot of clarity. And uh, here after having situated her definition of the novel, after having said that I am also talking about a modern novel with you know proper historical and geographical coordinates, I am talking about a modern novel which is an organic product of a specific environment. Yeah, Here in, in this case you know the historical and social uh, cultural context being whatever <coughs> has been uh, you know foregrounded by the Indian subcontinent. Yeah, After having said that she goes on to make the and th this, this thing what she does you know this move away from the pre-novel traditional narratives to situate the modernness of novel as we are now aware of. That is very important uh, uh, thing for, to do for her because she is also convincing us that I am talking about the same set of things that you are also talking about. I am not necessarily talking about the need for a different kind of historicity altogether. I am not trying to necessarily define novel in a new way for you. I do, uh, we are on the same page when we talk about novel. Yes, I mean, I mean novel 
uh, when I talk about novel, it's the same thing that the Western uh, tradition also spoke about. But I want to differ in the way in which I situate it historically. Yeah? So, uh, the way in which she situates it historically, it is within the world of the educated Indians. That's her own phrase, the world of the educated Indians, you know, how that changed at the wake of the colonial modernity. That begins, that, that is the starting point of her discussion. She again, you know, begins with the significance of the minute, as we noted earlier also. And then she uh, goes on to talk about the educated Indian readers and the kind of text that they were consuming at that point of time. Yesterday, if you remember, you know, from Priya Joshi's article, I showed you a, a, a table, the kind of translations of the 19th century text which were available to the Indian educated Indian in the 19th century itself. Yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very formidable, impressive list. So, the in educated Indian reader, that same reader who also later went on to write full length novels, who also went on to inaugurate a novelistic tradition within, uh, within India, they were in fact caught within a certain kind of a, di di uh, 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 a certain kind of a dilemma because the world, the society that they were reading from those uh, uh, British novels which were predominantly productions of the Victorian society and the cultural background that was their uh, immediate reality. It was very, very, very different. Yeah. So, uh, these novels, you know, were also, uh, even today Minakshi Mukherjee says, novels are written in urban areas by English educated people. That is, you know, that also remains one of the severe um, uh, contestations against Indian writing in English. Yeah. So, that aside, the uh, this particular society that these readers were getting used to, which was not really tying up well, which was not really sitting well with the reality that they were used to, that actually gave, uh, it gave rise to a discontinuity in, in tradition, a discontinuity in approach, yeah, because they knew very well that even if they are very, very impressed by the kind of novelistic productions in of Victorian uh, England, even if they wanted to write something like that, they cannot imitate the same pattern because the societal immediate cultural social realities are very different. Yeah? She elaborates this uh, further with uh, two examples, uh, the one of the earliest uh, uh, Marathi novels, Manju Ghosha. Any Marathi speakers over here? No, are you familiar with this novel, Manju Ghosha? Okay. And also, uh, one of the earliest novels from in, in Malayalam, Induleka. How many, are, how many of you are familiar with uh, Induleka? Family in the sense, you have read the, read the text. Yeah. So, it doesn't matter. Uh, in fact, these discussions are, are also quite important and uh, maybe if we have the time next week, we will also have a talk by one of the research scholars on Indu Lekha and what it really did to the Indian novelistic uh, tradition. Yeah. So, coming back to this discussion, when uh, Minakshi Mukherjee is talking about these uh, examples, Manju Khosha and Indu Lekha, she is also drawing her attention to a central problem that these writers of novels were facing. because. They were consuming a certain Western uh, product. They were trying to produce this a similar kind of a product for a different kind of an audience. So, the problem was to reconcile two sets of values. One obtained by reading an alien literature and the other available in life. This was, you know, as she also says, you know, maybe it is the same reason why only certain kind of novels were uh, becoming popular in India. Can one of you, you know, read out that? Brief passage, page 10, the last line of that paragraph. It is not surprising, therefore, that the two 18th century novels most popular among the early generation, English educated Indians, were the Sellas and the Vikar of Vikri, both of which emphasize moral qualities rather than narrated amoral uh, uh, adventures in the realistic settings of their own so, uh, the popularity of those novels also depended on the kind of, you know, the cultural, the emotional setting of Indian readers. Yeah. So, she is, you know, uh, further uh, uh, telling us what this problem of reconciliation between two sets of values is. Yeah. Because the dilemma was that the Indian writers in English, they were writing in a form that required individualism because that is a historical connection of novel. Yeah with the middle class and the rise of individualism. So, we are trying to write in a form that required individualism as a value, but they were also writing about a society that denies it. Yeah, this is uh, where perhaps, you know, the most significant departure, the significant contribution of Minakshi Mukherjee comes in. Yeah, she draws her attention to the world of the educated Indians. The dilemma was not really about colonial rule and uh, uh, the 
national movement. It was not about the choice of uh, say whether Macaulay or Gandhi. It was more about the choices that one was making internally. Yeah? The traditional modernity conflict was about a certain worldview that one wanted to embrace and the reality that one was part of. Yeah? This in fact, you know, this also sets the stage for a lot of discussions. It becomes easier. What, what Meenakshi Mukherjee also does is it becomes easier for the other critics and uh, uh, readers to engage with this problem after that. Because until that point of day, they knew that there was something tricky about this situation, but they didn't know how to articulate it. Yeah? And she gives this example from... Uh, the uh, Chandu Menon's uh, novel Indu Lekha, uh, he mentions in the preface, as stated at the outset, this is Chandu Menon talking, as stated at the outset, my object is to write a novel after the English fashion and it is evident that no ordinary Malayali lady can fill the role of the heroine in such a story. My Indu Lekha is not therefore an ordinary Malayali lady. And in the, in the you know, if you, uh, I, I think it is uh, somewhere in page uh, 15 or a little earlier. Yeah. So, if you go to that section and uh, read through, she gives further illustrations from the novel Indulekha and she talks about how the novel is not really reflecting reality just like it did in the western tradition. It was not, there is realism as a narrative technique, as a prose technique, but it is not about a society, a set of men and women that the author was encountering in his daily life. It was about the kind of men and women that he would like to encounter as products of modernity, as uh, men and women who are English educated and who are individualistic, who can make their own choices in terms of relationships, in terms of career. If you are familiar with the narrative, the plot of uh, uh, Indulekha, it is also about the kind of choices that uh, an English educated woman is making about her relationships, about her, uh, you know, about the way she would like to lead her life, about the critiques which are being offered against a number of traditional practices in terms of marriage, in terms of career choices, in terms terms of you know how the protagonist uh, the uh, uh, the male protagonist also uh, challenges the taboos against uh, travel how you know he exposes himself to a range of things which otherwise caste wise his occupation does not allow him to so it is about a modern society a modern malayali society that chandu menon has in his mind it is not about a malayali modern society that chandu menon has witnessed yeah so here there is an inherent problem in the way Realism it gets depicted not just in Indian novel in regional languages, but also in by extension in Indian writing in English. Now again, again you know uh, uh, recall the themes of those two earlier proto novels, uh, Shoshi Chandardat and Kailash Chandardat. Yeah, they were talking about the possibility of an insurrection because whatever they were seeing in and around them, it did not really lend itself to such a realist mode. Yeah? It was difficult to narrate that for whatsoever reasons, we will not get into those uh, things. But because the, uh, yeah, so because you know again coming back to Chandu Menon, he is talking about a novel which would project into the future, his novels, the characters, the setting, the emotional uh, dilemma, the sort of resolutions that the protagonist and the plot in general arrives at, it is all about something that he foresees. In that sense, you know, the novel, uh, if you take say Indulekha or an example from any other languages, there is an impossibility to connect with the society known to the author. Yeah? And that is not entirely anybody's fault because in, in some form they are trying to mimic the western form they also realize this is not a form this is not a society which is uh, uh, you know the society is not yet ready for those sort of individualistic concerns that the western novel is used to articulating yeah? and uh, in uh, page uh, 15 in fact you know she also uh, interestingly draws our attention to a certain paradox inherent in chandu menon's work yeah do, do you want to read out page 15 from say chandu menon who proclaimed in the introduction to indulekha are you all there? Page 15, somewhere in the middle of the page, the first paragraph. Yeah. Proclaimed in the introduction to Indulekha his desire to write in Malayalam, a realistic novel in the English style, forgot the intention by the time he finished the story. Yeah. The concluding lines echo the sentiments with which the oral recital of a Purana traditionally ends. All the characters mentioned have reached the summit of human happiness. And now may God bless, bless us and all who read this tale. The last line of this passage reveals the persistence of the pre-novel conventions of narrative in spite of the author's conscious adoption of the European mode and its deliberate debunking of the mythic imagination. 
So it's these details uh, that uh, Mukherjee pays attention to that makes her own study, her own uh, you know analysis very very interesting. They, I also want you to take notes about you know the kind of approach, the methodological and the systematic approach that uh, Mukherjee uh, makes. It's also useful you know when you practice your own sense of writing, how you know she draws from these multiple things and she is also not afraid to contradict herself, not afraid to point out the Con the contradictions which may damage the initial arguments that she is making because she is she is open to the uh, citation of a new inconvenience even when she is making a very pressing argument. Let's also you know read out this quote. Can one of you read out this quote about you know Western novel in India? Whatever term for the novel was adopted in the Indian language, the formal and thematic aspirations of the early Indian novel were the same as those of the English novels read by pioneering Indian novelists. The English educated generation which came of age in India around 1860 was brought upon the Tory novels of the time and seems to have been influenced by these. Yeah. So, uh, she again you know, was trying to say that maybe there are these contestations especially within the native tradition about whether this term can be used for novel or the other term can be used. She said it really does not matter because regardless of the language in which you were writing whether it is one of the regional languages or uh, English regardless of the language you all had to move away from the familiar setting you all had to write in a very different way and not necessarily you know uh, uh, produce a very Indian novel in that sense a very traditional uh, uh, narrative based novel you all had to mimic certain aspects but also you know mediate in particular ways so that that uh, that dilemma also is uh, resolved. What is the challenge over here? What is the problem over here that she is again foregrounding? Yes, again to uh, quote her own words to talk about the incompatibilities between English and the Indian temperaments. She talks about you know she is in agreement with all the others when she says novel initially developed in a colonial situation. Yeah, and where absolute superiority of everything published in English was taken for granted. I want you to pause over here and then we will also take a look at. Uh, uh, one of the recent complaints you know in 1992 Ejaz Ahmed in one of his essays he uh, speaks about how the only literary document produced in English is now seen as the national document all else is regional hence minor and forgettable. So, that English emerges in this imagination not as one of the Indian languages which undoubtedly it is, but as the language of national integration and bourgeois civility. Yeah? So, the, the, the sort of certain national status that English was being accorded to, it is not a new thing. Yeah? It was always already there for various reasons, she does not really, I mean actually Mukherjee does not really explore the reasons behind that, but she says there was an inherent superiority for everything published, everything written in English. Yeah? And she also says maybe the problem was that we were not mimicking the right kind of uh, uh, English novel. She says maybe the British model was not really suitable for the Indian mind in the 19th century, maybe they had to look at you know the, the Russian novels which had a more you know philosophical bent to it, you know, it more explore the uh, psychological dilemmas rather than you know just talking about uh, realism which is what the British fiction in the uh, early uh, 19th century and uh, uh, in the early 19th century did. And uh, she also thinks maybe when they imitated both the uh, regional writers and the Indian writers in English, maybe when they imitated, they imitated the wrong kind of uh, masters and maybe they imitated the mediocre English novels, often devaluing their own talents in the process. This is in fact, you know, it is a very post-colonial thing to say. Yeah. This is where, you know, Meenakshi Mukherjee also differs and departs from the others, yeah, because the others have been uncritically uh, acknowledging the influence that the the um, British novels had <coughs> on Indian writing in English. Remember the appeals, the various kinds of appeals that Srinivas Iyengar was making to the, uh, you know, uh, the English writer abroad, the Indian critic abroad, the Indian reader uh, in India, yeah, for uh, appeal of sympathy, yeah, asking for some kind of a generosity. But here is a post-colonial critic, Minakshi Mukherjee, also exposing us to perhaps the the mediocre nature of the originals which were being available for our, being made available for us to copy yeah for the early indian writers to um, copy and also she talks about you know how there are basic incompatibilities between english and indian temperaments maybe which is why there are a lot of unresolved dilemmas both in narration and also in the criticisms that we uh, employ this is you know in the second chapter she draws attention to further uh, uh, a range of uh, different other things you know such as 
uh, Serampur mission prayers, the translation of the Bible into uh, Indian languages, how the missionary enterprise became uh, important. Yeah? And here in fact, it is in this chapter which we shall talk about in the next session perhaps. Uh, first, you know, there is a historical value uh, that she reassesses. And in the second chapter titled The Novel of Purpose, she is setting up certain literary yardstick. Literary and critical yardsticks. Yeah. So, and Meenakshi Mukherjee also undoubtedly remains as one of the pioneers of, you know, who, who started practicing the art of criticism and using it on Indian novel, particularly in Indian uh, novels in English. And till date, many of the formulations that we have about Indian writing in English, many of the ways in which we privilege one issue over the other, it is all based on the uh, things that she wrote about, the way in which you know she framed the issue. So, we will come back to look at uh, the uh, second chapter take some time out you know just read through that essay because that also it is also in a certain way foundational to approach the the, the 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 kinds of frameworks which are being available for us to talk about Indian writing in English yeah and also begin to use your critical faculty when you are even reading you know critical texts yeah are there places where you would differ because you are also you know simultaneously doing a number of other courses yeah so does your uh, knowledge, your, this, your reading which you gathered from another course, does it become useful to critically evaluate the critical piece that you are reading. Do not look at the critical work, the secondary source as you know something which cannot be contested against. Yeah? So, uh, because only when you begin to develop that faculty, it will begin to reflect in your, the, the, the form of writing also that you begin to adopt. I hope you will have more to say and I hope I will also give you more time to speak when we talk about the novels. Yeah. It is said you know this this uh, state setting is very important I feel you know otherwise you know if we later if we think when we discuss the novels we will come back to talk about certain issues it may not happen or that may not be the right uh, time. So, I thought the first few sessions I will just give you an outline of the available scholarship, the discussions which had been happening. So, it also uh, allows you to move freely, depart freely without you know coming back to the origins again <coughs> and again. Yeah. So, in your presentations also keep this in mind, you are not really trying to go in tandem with the many things that we uh, have uh, we speak about in the first few sessions, but you are also trying to move away from those in certain ways. Yeah. How these readings have, you are not really trying to replicate the similar kind of a, uh, a, a reading in your own uh, say in your own reading of the novels. On the other hand, you are also trying to tell us how those things have informed your understanding yeah. and if there is a certain understanding that you already have and if you do not know where to trace it back to maybe that is again you know a thing that you should be doing yeah as I think you know I, I told you uh, earlier I do not I am not very sure about this uh, the way in which we accept Rushdi as a canon and the way, the way in which you know uh, we boo something like say Chedan Bhagat yeah. Yeah. Does it have something to do with the critical tradition which has inadvertently formed our uh, reading habits? Yeah. So, how does you know Rashti become part of the Booker Prize and uh, they say uh, Chetan Bhagat at best you know you buy him at the railway uh, station book counter. Yeah. So, how do these things really operate? Yeah. Is it about language alone? Is it about certain narratives that the writers are talking about or is it also about the the positioning of certain authors in you know certain ways about the prizes associated with it or the controversies associated with it yeah. So, I also want you to question these notions not because these sort of questions will not just improve your understanding of Indian writing in English, but it also will allow you to question your general reading habits and how you engage with text, text not just you know in a bound book form about the stacks which you see around you as well. So, shall we call it a day?